Today we're going to learn about the blockchain. But before we do, I want to welcome you to the Muda channel. Muda is a technology company that is leveraging blockchain to bring about real life business solutions uh, in the crypto space. And we're doing this through our NFT engine, our DeFi platform, and also our over the counter exchange at Muda.exchange. We really want to change how crypto is seen or viewed across the continent. In this video, I'm going to explain in simple basic terms what the blockchain is, how it works using examples so that you can even go and explain it to your grandmother or maybe your uncle. So to begin with blockchain, let's start with the word the block. What exactly is the block? Just like any block that you see, you know, a block to build a house, anything, it is just a container that has something in it. And in this case of the blockchain, a block contains data. It can be any data. Like uh, for blockchains that hold NFTs, the data is essentially the NFT tokens plus their, their uh, data. But for an Ethereum blockchain or maybe the, the Bitcoin blockchain, in the block it is just the data contained is the transactions that have been happening on the network. And for Ethereum, it's essentially a list of the transactions also, plus also smart contract interactions with the code that happens on the network. And for any other blockchains which are out there, uh, it really depends on what information, what data does the blockchain collect. I'll give an example. For the Muda token, for the Muda token, and, uh, which is going to be the Muda blockchain, the block will essentially be containing the transaction history that is happening on the Muda exchanges, both on the centralized and the decentralized exchanges. So any block that you see out there, if there's a blockchain that, that collects information about internet usage, if there's a blockchain that collects information about uh, logistics and, uh, and shipping, that is essentially what will be held in the block. That data about that specific uh, uh, blockchain will be held in the block. And this is what we call the ledger because we are capturing value exchange. Even if it is an IoT device, even if it is your phone, and we are capturing that data, we are exchanging the value. But something to note about the blocks, each different blockchain has a limit of the numbers of transactions or maybe a limit of the data that it can take in a block. For example, the Bitcoin blockchain, I think can take up to a maximum of 1,500 transactions in a block and it has a specific amount of time that it takes for a new block to form. So when the block becomes full, what happens next? We now need to add that block onto the network. And we do this through a process that is called mining. And this is for the proof of work uh, mechanisms that uh, use proof of work to do what? To do the mining. And since Ethereum and Bitcoin are proof of work consensus models, uh, there needs to be a proof that work has been done. Now this brings us to what we call the hash. You may ask yourself, what is a hash? What is the hashing function? In simple terms, a hashing function is a simple mathematical black box that on one end, if you put in information, let's say a letter A, on the other end, it is going to spit out a hash. And the hash is a collection of numbers and letters that maybe for you, you may not understand, but these devices, these computers understand how to read it. There are many types of hashing functions out there, like the Bitcoin blockchain uses the SHA-256, the SHA-256 and SHA in full is essentially a secured hashing algorithm and 256 is the number of digits in ones and zeros that is going to spit out. For Ethereum, it uses the KKAK. 256 and it belongs also to uh, another family of uh, the SHA-3 I think, the SHA-3, a secured hashing algorithm uh, 3 that I think was made by a scientist called uh, Rodrigo, I need, I need to check the name. But what these fu hashing functions do essentially is take an input, calculate it, do some magical mathematics, which I'll get into those deeper conversations much, much later on uh, in the video. We just want to make this crypto thing easier for you. You take the information, put it into this mathematical box, 
and out here it spits out a function or a hash that uh, that, the, that, that the network understands, that the computer understands what it is. The great thing about hashes in data encryption is that you cannot guess the input. Once the input has been put and the function is spit out, you can now not guess it anymore what was the input. So this is great for data encryption and security. Another amazing factor about these hashes is that when you change the input, let's say I put in A and I get 1. If I put in AA, it will give me something totally different, maybe 2, 5. If I put in AA5, it may give me something different. So that is very great for when we want to achieve immutability. When we want to achieve something that doesn't change once it is registered, it, it helps us avoid forgery so that if you try to change anything, this side, the output will always change and show that something has changed. And also something to note about the hashing function is that the greater the amount of data you're trying to hash is the more time it will take. Let's say if you're trying to hash just your name, it may take just maybe two, a couple of seconds. But when you are trying to hash uh, a book, an encyclopedia, it may take a couple of minutes to several minutes to be able to spit out the hash of that book that you're trying to put out. And therefore we have all these computers around the world which are essentially doing mining. They are trying to guess what is going to be the hash or the password of the next block uh, in the blockchain. And that's how mining is actually happening across the world. It does take a significant amount of computing power and that's why it does work. It is a mathematical model that is actually using computing power to produce an encryption that is necessary for the data transfer or maybe data storage on the blockchain. The next key thing to know about the blockchain is the decentralization of the blockchain. Let me, let me give an example. Let's take your hospital. When you go to the hospital and you're sick, it is only your doctor or maybe your, your hospital administrators who have access to your data. But it's only them who can change it and it's only them who can actually delete it or in case they, they don't want to give it to you anymore. So it is important to notice that that is how most centralized systems work. But when we come to decentralized systems is that a group of people or very many people across the world, like in this case the Bitcoin network, is that anyone can participate, anyone can vote, can mine, can participate in the network and that brings about decentralization. Everyone has access to that server, to all that information that is held on the Bitcoin blockchain. So it really helps us in decentralization. So you may ask me like, Davin, if everyone has access to the network, how do we stop people from creating fraudulent transactions? How do we stop people from uh, making, maybe giving themselves a lot of money? Because this is digital money, you can just type it in and you have it. This is where the hashing functions and encryptions come in, is that the way the blockchain works is that if you try to change a hash that has existed before, like I've said, if you try to change the input, the output will also change. So since it's a public blockchain, since it's a public ledger, everyone can see it, we can know when you try to lie to us, we can know what you have done, who has done it, on which computer have they done it on, and it's all traceable down to the dot. So this makes it uh, a very secure system across the world. Anyone can participate and that brings in new economics and new things that we can uh, use this technology for. Let me give another example. Let's say you are in a class in a centralized system, which would be like this. You do the exam, all of you hand your, all of you hand your papers to the teacher. The teacher sits down in his home, grades you, uh, gives you marks. Let's just give an example, the teacher doesn't like you, maybe because you look ugly or maybe you took his wife, something like that. If the teacher doesn't like you, you are going to fail. But in a decentralized system of examination is that, uh, like the one which Coursera uses, I like it a lot, you have to grade five to six other papers before you get back the grade for your paper. And that means that all the other students also have to grade your paper so that you can all grade each other and give each other a fair mark. This introduces a lot of fairness. It removes a little bit of that maybe nepotism or maybe favoritism that comes in in a centralized system. 
So in a decentralized system, you are able to all participate. And why would you want to participate? The money that was going to be given to the teacher to teach, to, 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 to run your examinations, to mark them and grade you, is now shared amongst the students. I think this can also be a great way to, you know, implement decentralization in schools is that if every student graded the other student anonymously because we have to add that factor anonymously you don't know whose paper you are grading all you are caring about is the answer correct is the answer right on the mark and this introduces some bit of creativity there is no wrong answer in this case and so a lot of student data is going to be uh, based on what you have actually learned, what you have understood, and that becomes great for, for the system. So this is how decentralization works. So if you are to add all this together, a block, a hashing function, and then the decentralization, we are now in the building blocks of what is the blockchain. So now let's answer the question, why is it called a blockchain? We have understood that there is, is a block which is containing data, that data is put into a hashing function that spits out a hash and then now that data is spread across a decentralized network different people across the world participating what now introduces the chain part of the block into the blockchain is that if you are going to create i'm just giving an example on the bitcoin network if you're going to create the next block you must use the previous blocks function to calculate what the, the new function will be. So you find that the new function is always tied to the previous function. And speaking of the function bit is that if someone goes back five, 10 transactions ago and tries to give themselves money that they have already spent, the whole network will change because like we said, if you change the hashing function, its output will also change. If you try to change the input of the hashing function, each output will also change. So all the other things will be different. And anyone on the network can see that, hey, someone is trying to do some fraudulent transaction and quickly you'll be identified and rooted out of the network. So in conclusion, we have the blocks that contain data. We have a hashing function that miners around the world try to guess what is the password of that block. And once that block has been uh, verified and is added to the block, it is tied to the previous block through the previous hash that was created for that block. And even for the new hash that is created, the next block that will come after that will use this new created hash to calculate the new hash for that block. So thank you so much for watching this video and those of you maybe who are listening to the video, we really appreciate it. And for me and the team, if you really love what we are doing here on this channel. Make sure to give us a follow, MundaRightHQ on Twitter. Follow us on all our social medias. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Medium. If you want to get a detailed breakdown of all these concepts, you can go to our Medium articles, MundaHQ, and you can now get much deeper into this. But we want to make this crypto thing easy for you, and that's why we are really breaking this down with examples and making it simpler. We will go deeper into some of these concepts on a much later video. But other than that, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.